There's a trope in science fiction where a bunch of settlers get onto their big spaceship and they fly to another star system and halfway through the journey a warp drive spacecraft shows up and lets people know that there's better technology now and they should have just waited for that advanced technology to be developed and they wasted multiple generations of their lives on this journey. Uh, so does it make sense to wait for better technology? What's the ideal amount of time? Here's a video that explains it. It's hard to really wrap your mind around the vast distances between stars. The fastest spacecraft ever launched into an interstellar trajectory right now is Voyager 1. If it was directed at the nearest star, which it isn't, it would take tens of thousands of years to make the journey across the interstellar gulf. Even so, groups like Breakthrough Starshot and Icarus Interstellar are working on plans right now to try and send spacecraft to other stars, ideally within our lifetimes. But we can see how quickly technology is advancing all around us, from material science to high energy physics, not to mention reusable rockets. It seems reasonable to ask, should we invest in an interstellar mission now, or wait a few decades or even centuries for better technology to come along, which would make the trip much shorter. There's a great short story from astrobiologist Caleb Scharf about a settlement mission to Alpha Centauri. As the multi-generational settlers are being prepared for arrival, they're given regular updates by the ship's computer. It turns out a quantum drive was recently developed back on Earth and one of the planets has already been settled. Sorry, you and your descendants spent thousands of years sacrificing your lives to make this journey, but we can pick you up and take you to your new homes if you like. Should we invest enormous resources into heading to another star now, or wait for better technology to make the journey cheaper and quicker? This is known as the weight calculation, and there's a paper written by Andrew Kennedy that attempts to calculate what advanced civilizations should decide. Once again, this is a highly readable paper with some light math that you can gloss over if you like. I highly recommend that you read it, and I'll put a link in the show notes. As I said earlier, we're looking at tens of thousands of years for the Voyagers to reach Bernard's star, six light years away, and they're not even headed in the right direction. Bernard's star is a red dwarf with just 14% the mass of the sun. It's a little farther than Proxima Centauri, but it's an ancient star and has fewer of the red super flares that we see with younger red dwarfs, so it might be a better settlement target. Let's say that an advanced spacecraft could be put together with our best technology to shave that time down to 12,000 years. But what if the constantly advancing technology continues to bring that flight time down, say, Every 100 years of technological advancement cuts the flight time down by half. Then, according to Kennedy, a future interstellar Voyager mission would only need to wait 690 years for a mission that could complete the journey at 6% the speed of light, which gets you to Bernard's star in a century. Add that 100 years of flight time and you reach our nearest star in 790 years. But if you absolutely wanted to get there first, you'd wait for 637 years and then take a longer flight time of 145 years, bringing your arrival to 782 years later. If you're willing to spend an extra 45 years of flight, you can reach your destination eight years earlier. If the technology doubles faster than every 100 years, say every 50 years, then the math changes again. Now you can wait for 371 years, fly for 70 years, and arrive after 441 years. If warp drives, wormholes, or some other form of faster than light travel is impossible, then the calculations show that there is an ideal period to wait before attempting the journey. But it all depends on the priority of an advanced civilization with interstellar desires. Do you want to get there with the minimum amount of energy and expense? Or do you want to get there the absolute fastest, whatever it costs? Do they want to make absolutely sure that explorers aren't overtaken by future missions? I'll talk about that in a second, but first I'd like to thank some of the longest running patrons who've supported us for years. Todd Main, Ernie Jacobs, Steve DeGroof, and the rest of our 845 patrons for their generous support. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. How quickly can we expect interstellar velocity rates to increase? To help figure this out, Kennedy tries to get a realistic calculation for the rate at which interstellar velocity will increase. Since the power required to go faster is proportional to the square of the velocity, you need four times the energy to go twice as fast. 
world energy consumption rises about 1.4% per year. So you can map that directly to an increase in velocity. People have been predicting doom and gloom for humanity's growth for centuries. According to the pessimists, a crisis is always around the corner. And maybe it is. Maybe the coronavirus or global warming or the robot uprising is almost upon us. But humanity has survived disasters, world wars, incompetent politicians and pandemics in the past. And I know it doesn't feel like things are getting better when you watch the news, which, by the way, you probably shouldn't. I mean, it'll only bum you out. But by almost every standard, you can measure humanity is doing better and better every year. There's less poverty, less infant mortality, less death from war, lower crime rates, and an overall increase in our standard of living. The growth is becoming more and more stable every year. And don't just take my word for it. I'll link to an inspirational video from Canada's Commander Chris Hadfield to give you some 2020 optimism. If your increase in interstellar velocity continues to increase, things get more complicated because of relativity. As you get closer and closer to the speed of light, it takes more and more energy, eventually approaching an infinite amount of energy. But these effects only really kick in when you're at a significant portion of the speed of light, like 99%. However, once you get going those kinds of speeds, time dilation kicks in and you experience a shorter journey than the people you left at home. Go fast enough and you could travel billions of light years in a single human lifetime. The psychological effect on potential travelers is that they wouldn't want to embark on the journey because an unexpected jump in technology would make their journey worthless. Kennedy calls this the incentive trap. They wasted their lives flying to another star only to be picked up halfway by an even more advanced spacecraft, which gets picked up by an even more advanced spacecraft. But Kennedy argues that this worry probably isn't realistic. Although we see huge historical jumps forward in technology and power use, the actual year by year increase is incremental. Solar power and battery storage gets a little better each year. Ion engines have been tested and improved for decades, but they've only been regularly put on spacecraft in the last decade or so. And engineers still struggle to get solar sails to uh, solar sail. When those first fusion drives finally come online or the high powered lasers from breakthrough Starshot, we'll see them slowly increase in power and capability year by year, following a growth curve that seemed obvious in retrospect. So what's the final number? Assuming humanity's power use continues to grow at 1.4% per year, we should wait 635 years for the right time to send a mission to Bernard Star which is six light years away, taking 135 years to make the journey. And this is just short enough that a human being might be able to make the journey in a single long lived lifetime. But if the energy growth rates drop to 0.5%, then the journey will have to go much slower, taking 400 years to complete the journey. This will require multi-generational ships where people need to be comfortable with the reality that it'll be their descendants who actually set foot on the new planet. Even though the math says that that's the soonest we'd be able to reach that star, who'd be willing to make that gamble? The purpose of Kennedy's paper is to show that the history of humanity's exponential growth in power and capability can help us predict the future of our exploration and settlement of nearby star systems. We don't know what advanced propulsion systems will be developed to make the journey, but we can calculate roughly when they will and when it makes the most sense to reach out to another star and when you should wait for better technology to come along. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here are the names of the patrons who support us at the $10 level and more. Want to see your name here? Support the work we do? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and I send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. We've done a few videos about ideas for interstellar travel, but the one I really like is called Project Dragonfly, and it involves sending a light sail driven robotic probe to Alpha Centauri over the course of about 100 years. 
You can watch that video now.